I had fun at the yard sale, not because I was helping sell. I was uh, passing out tracks. I had a blast. <laughs> so I don't know if that uh, helped or discouraged people from buying. So, but uh, a lot of tracks were handed out. A lot of people said, so to my surprise, they said, Jake, we're looking for a church. I said, well, praise God. See you tomorrow, 9 o'clock. And they just looked at me like, what? <laughs> but I had fun. So, All right, well, take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 3. You know, I, I'm having a hard time because your bulletin says 3, 9, B through 11. This will not come as a surprise. We're not getting that far. Um, but I don't know. We've got to take a second and think back to the beginning of Colossians and think what had happened. Because I think the flow is so important as we continue our study this morning. And so as we review for just a second, I wanted you to think back all the way to chapter 1. Before chapter 1, do you remember how the church at Colossae started? Okay, good. Let me get those notes and we'll start over. The church at Colossae started because there was a young man by the name of Epaphras who he traveled to Ephesus and he heard the gospel from Paul. He repented of his sins. He came to know Christ. You Remember? Okay, one person, good, good. He came to know Christ, and he traveled all the way back to Colossae, and he was so on fire for Jesus that he was preaching the gospel, people were coming to Christ, and the church at Colossae started. It started because of the faithfulness of Paul to be committed to what I believe is the Great Commission, right? When we look at Matthew 28, 18 and following, what does this say? Go therefore and make disciples. The first step in discipleship is what? People making a profession of faith. And so Epaphras was on fire for Christ. He goes back. He's telling people about Christ. The church starts... It's a young church, young believers. They're growing in their walk with Christ. And then something began to happen, right, within the church at Colossae. There were these group of people that began to come into the church and they began to say to the church, yes, believe in Jesus. But the theme of Colossians is the preeminence of Christ. And these, these, these tea, false teachers had come in and they said, yes, believe in Jesus, but then you need to do all of these other things. Do you remember? We can interact. It's okay. Yes. They said, yes, you need to do all of these other things in order to be saved. Epaphras, being a, a man of God, right? Being a believer, goes, whoa, 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 wait a second. We need to do something. So what does Epaphras do? He makes the trek back to his mentor, the Apostle Paul, who loves Jesus, and he gets to Paul. Well, where's Paul? In prison. And he says, Paul, this is going on. And Paul responds by writing the book of Colossians. And the theme of Colossians is the preeminence of Christ. Over and over and over again, he is saying, yes, Jesus isn't enough. Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is above this. And he writes in Colossians, remember, in the beginning of chapter 1, he, he gives thanks to God. You get down to verse 9. Listen to this, what he does. He says, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. That blows my mind. You know why it blows my mind? Paul is in jail. He's in prison, and he says in verse 9, we have not ceased to pray for you. If I'm in jail, don't expect a letter like this from me. I'm going to say, get me out of here. But Paul was in prison, and he says that he has not ceased to pray for you. But he, but he doesn't pray, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub. Look at what he prays. 
when he prays for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Here's why. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. He says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, brothers and sisters. And then he gets to verse 13 and following, gives us this beautiful picture of who Christ is, right? And he says, let me just remind you that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough in verse 13. He says, oh, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. And then he tells us about Jesus. He tells us about who he is and how awesome Jesus is. And then we get into chapter 2 and he says, Paul writes and he says, look, verse 8, Watch out, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ. He says, watch out for what they tell you. Watch out for what they're trying to trick you with. Because he says, Jesus is preeminent. And then verses 16 16 to the end of chapter 2, he outlines and he says, look, don't let these false teachers act as your judge. Don't let them play the referee as that pertains to your salvation. He says, don't let them trick you into saying you've got to live a legalistic lifestyle. Don't let them trick you by, by saying that you've got to practice mysticism and you have to practice asceticism. And then chapter 3, he says, okay, here's what you need to do. Remember this? He says, set your mind on things above. Focus on Christ. And then we spent a very long time in verses 5 and following where he says, therefore, he says, okay, remember that Christ is preeminent. Remember how awesome Jesus is. Don't let him take you captive by all of these other things that are being taught. You need to set your mind on things above. And he says, remember the work that Christ has accomplished in your life. And then verse 5, he says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to all of these things, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And then we spent the past several weeks looking at verse 8, where he says, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abuse to speech from your mouth, and do not lie to one another. Remember, Paul was saying, now he gets very practical, right? Chapters 1 and 2 are more theological. He says, remember who Jesus is. He is God. He is God incarnate. He is preeminent over all else. Don't let them persuade you with these empty deception and philosophy. He says, set your mind on things above. Chapters 3 and 4 gets very practical. And remember, when we looked at verse 8, we talked about that first word for quite some time when he says that word anger, that's that kindling anger, right? Those are the coals of wickedness in our hearts. And we ask the question, what is it that triggers our smoldering heart to respond with these actions? And then we come to the second part of verse 9 this morning. And I want us to, as we continue to study the Word of God, I, I hope that we can really draw out two reminders that Paul gives to the church at Colossae. And, and as, we, as we look at these two reminders, I want us to ask ourselves this question, how is the power of the cross affecting your daily life? In my daily life. Because I was thinking about it. All the way back to the beginning of Colossians. Paul was being faithful to the Great Commission, right? He was preaching the Word of God. Making disciples. Epaphras comes to Christ. Epaphras on fire for Christ. He goes back to Colossae. Shares the Gospel. Y'all, I'm not very good at math. But there's, I can't even see it back there. There's 80 people, 90 people in this, here this morning. Minus all the kids. Okay, so if we were faithful, each one of us, to the Great Commission, to preach the Word of God, share the Word of God with people, invite people to church, if we invited one person, shared the gospel with them next week, they come into church, we double the size of the church. I'm not about numbers, y'all know me well enough. 
But if that happened and we're all discipling people, then that means that we'd have what? 90 times 2? What is that? Okay, 180. And so then if those people come to Christ, right? And so we look another month down the road or two months down the road, those people come to Christ. They get baptized. They're walking faithfully with Christ. And they all of a sudden are on fire for Christ. And they go out and they're sharing the gospel with people. So now we're at 180. So let's say half of 180 invite somebody else to church. Now what is 90 times 3? I don't know, bigger numbers that I can count to. So then that happens, right? So this is how it all works on the Great Commission. Paul was being faithful to the Great Commission, and you and I as brothers and sisters in Christ get to be faithful to the Great Commission. Guess what? When we're sharing the gospel with people, I got rejected like crazy the last two days. Praise God. One guy said, Jake, I'm not here to talk about philosophy. I was like, okay, well, me neither. He goes, I want to shop. I said, great, go ahead and shop. And we'll, let's get together next week. We'll have coffee. And he just rolled his eyes. He said, Jake, I want to talk about Socrates and Pluto and all that. And I was like, hey, man, that's not my cup of tea. I don't know nothing about those guys. They're gone. I know about Jesus. But if we were faithful to do all of these things, I just, it, my, I'm excited. I'm so excited. And we're not even going to get through the second part of verse 9 this morning. But oh, well. So as we look at verse 9, just, just look at what it says. He, he just finished this list. He says, do not lie to one another. That was fun. I, I asked a lot of you how you are this morning. You're like, I'm not going to answer that. Somebody said, I'm blessed, and somebody else said, I'm redeemed. Those are good answers. But the second part of verse 9, look at what he says. He says, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, verse 10, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Verse 11, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Yo, that's the theme of Colossians. The end of verse 11, Christ is all and in all. Christ is awesome. So we look at the second part of verse 9, and the question that ought to immediately pop into our minds is, when did we, as believers, he's talking to believers, the church at Colossae, when did we lay aside the old self? He says, he uses that word since. Since you laid aside the old self with his evil practices. So, we love grammar. I do not like grammar, but I'm trying. So, the word, since you laid aside. That phrase, it's a verb, aorist, tense. It's a participle. It's a plural, nominative, masculine. It's a circumstantial participle. Does that mean anything to you? Okay. Me neither. So let me read this to you. The aorist tense, the aorist verb tense is used by the writer to present the action of a verb as a snapshot event. The verb's action is portrayed simply and in summary fashion without respect to any process. In the indicative mood, the aorist usually denotes past time. Okay, so just so you're aware, it's not in the indicative mood. Okay, so... But he goes on and he says, while an aorist participle, that's, that's what this phrase is. It's an aorist participle. Usually refers to an antece or antecedent time with respect to the main verb. Anybody confused? Good, me too. So what is a participle? Participles uh, do not have mood, but can function in an imperative sense. Okay, that still hasn't helped us a lot. So he says, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. The question is, when did that happen? At what point did that happen for a believer? Well, let's look at some other passages. Has the same idea of, as Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Let's look at that. This is interesting. Chapter 2, verse 15 It says, when he had disarmed 
the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. That's through Christ, right? So that word disarmed has the same idea as the phrase, since you laid aside. I believe when he says, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, he's talking about what we would call as positional sanctification. That is, when we came to a point in our life where we realized the seriousness of our sin, we, what did we do? We repented of our sins, right? Thank you. We repented of our sins. We, we understood that our sin, whatever it is, our sins, our, our lying, our sinfulness, our selfishness, our pride, all of those things, we realized that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. We came to understand that we needed to turn from our sin, turn to Christ, and embrace the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. When we did that, I believe that is when we laid aside the old self, correct? We were, and why can't I say that? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So I believe that the second part of verse 9 is talking about positional sanctification. That is the point in time when you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you were adopted into the family of God, right? You were his child. What an amazing God. He reminds these, this church, he says, since you laid aside, this is in the past, when you came to Jesus Christ, You laid aside the old self with its evil practices. We could talk about practices and, and evil and, and for quite some time, but, but the idea of the word practice, it just has it's the, the deeds. As far as like we could look at passages, listen to this in Matthew 16, 27. He says, For the Son of Man is, is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And will then repay every man according to his deeds. That's the exact same Greek word that we find in our text in Colossians chapter 3 when we look at the word practice. The word practice means deeds and actions. We could look at other passages, but for time we're not going to. We could look at like Luke 22, Acts 19, Romans 8. Romans 12, this is all over in Scripture. So this brings up a challenging question. So this question arises when we talk about the battle of sin that the believer faces, right? Do we have a battle with sin as, as believers? Yeah. Okay. We come up with a question does a believer have one nature and or two natures? Okay. You have to follow that up with another question. You have to follow that up with another question. Because then you have to ask the question, what is meant by the term nature? Right? So, let me just share a couple of things with you really quickly, okay? Because when I, when I look at Colossians chapter 3, Verse 9, when he says, since you laid aside the old self with his evil practices, that happened at the point of salvation, right? You placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You laid aside your sin. You repented of your sins and you turned to Jesus. Yes? Okay. So we still struggle with sin. So the question is, do we have one nature or two natures? What do we mean by the term nature? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want us to see a couple of things. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Look at what he says. I quoted this to you earlier. But he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what does it say? He is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Here we go again. I didn't write it in my notes and I can't even remember where Galatians is in the Bible. There it is. Whew. 
So Paul says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. I think the question we have to answer, we would agree, right? As believers, we struggle with sin. I don't think we need to make a huge ordeal about one nature, two natures, things like that. One commentator says this, quote, The flesh. The flesh, the Greek word sarex, is the willing instrument of sin and is subject to sin to such a degree that wherever flesh is, all forms of sin are likewise present and no good thing can live in the sarex. The term flesh may be used in a material sense. However, it is frequently given a non-material meaning to refer to the old nature of the flesh. That capacity which all men have to serve and please self. The capacity to leave God out of one's life. The flesh as a capacity for sin is described in Paul's Christian experience in Romans 7. It involves lust and controls the mind. It governs the life of the non-Christian. The solution to the dilemma of Romans 7 is the power of the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8. In a renewed mind, according to Romans 12, that reckons the flesh crucified. I think the better question is not do we have one or two natures. The question is what do we mean by the term nature? We all agree that we struggle with sin as believers until the day we die, yes? Okay, I believe we have one nature, and I believe that we have one nature because when we come to realize our sin, right? Our sin and our need of a Savior, we repent of our sins, and what does the Bible tell us? He says, when you repent of your sins, you believe in creation, you are what? You are a new creation. You don't have two natures inside of us doing this. I don't believe that. Now, I do believe that we battle with sin, right? We battle with sin all day long, every day, because what do we have? The Word of God. We have Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the armor of God. We have Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, yada, 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 all those things. And then what does it say? The what? The deeds of the flesh. So I believe we have one nature, but we have that battle with what I, the term I would use is we have that battle, that fight with the flesh, with sin. Our, um, the part of our humanness that is not regenerated. Or re part of us that's sin. We battle with sin. So I'm not going to make a huge ordeal about it. We struggle with sin all the time as believers. But I think it's important. I think what Paul's point is, is that in verse 9, if I'm in the right book, in verse 9 he says, Since you have laid aside... That was when you the point when you came to Christ. And then in verse 10, I love it. I love it. And verse 10 says, and what happens? And have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. This is great. He says, you have put on. I love grammar, not really. But he, those words have put on. It's a verb, aorist tense. Middle voice, it's a participle, plural. Plural, what does it mean? This is a continual process of, of putting something on. It is continually, the idea is getting dressed, getting clothed. Remember in verse 8, we were told to get rid of all of these things, right? Put them, lay them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, abusive speech, and slander. Get rid of them. And then he says in verse 9, since because you are a child of God's, You've laid aside these evil practices. And then he challenges them. He says, church, believers, here's the second reminder. He says, look, you need to continue to be like Jesus. You need to continue to be like Jesus. Well, this idea of put on is all over in Scripture. Listen to these verses. In Romans chapter 13, verse 12. It says the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
This is a continual process that we do as brothers and sisters in Christ. Romans 13, verse 14, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision, here it is, for the flesh, for the flesh, the struggle with sin in regards to its lust. 1 Corinthians 15, he says, For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and the mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the same that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Paul says, Church, remember that positionally you are set apart from the name of Jesus. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And then in verse 10, he says, look, you need to continue to be set apart, continue to become conformed to the image of Jesus. In Galatians 3, 27, he says, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. This is the idea of put on. In Ephesians 6, the armor of God, what does he say? He says, put on the full armor of God. That's all the time, right? When we talk about the armor of God, that doesn't just happen. Once in your life, go, whoop, I got my armor on, I'm ready. This is every second of every day that we're doing this because we live in a sin-cursed world, and it's hard, isn't it? Okay. Okay. I think it's hard. Maybe I'm the only one. Okay. He uses the same, the same word in Ephesians 6.14 where he says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. This word put on is, is, is all over in the, the book of Colossians. Listen to these quotes. Calvin says this, quote, The old man is whatever we bring from your mother's womb and whatever we are by nature. It is called the old man because we are first born from Adam and afterward are born again through Christ. And Thomas Goodwin, there are but two men that are seen standing before God. There's Adam and Jesus Christ. And these two men have all other men hanging at their girdles. The Greek, uh, the Greek verbs translated put off and put on in Colossians 3, 9 and 10 indicate a once for all action. When we trust Christ, we put off the old life and put on the new. The old man has been buried and the new man is now in control. But the verb translated renewed is a present participle. The idea is one who is constantly being renewed the crisis of salvation leads to the process of sanctification becoming more like jesus christ in colossians 3 verse 10 he says and have put on the new self and look at the word who is being that word being is a continual process right I don't care if you're 6, 18, 25, 30, and higher. If you are a believer, we are to, this applies to us, who is being renewed. Always being renewed. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean when it says being renewed? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is my mom's favorite verse. My mom went to be with the Lord when she was 50 years old. In verse 16 and following, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying. Can anybody agree with that? Body's decaying a little bit. You know what I find interesting? We talk a lot, and some of you are like, Jake, just wait till you get to be my age. And I'm like, Lord, please, no. No way. I can't even walk straight. Our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being, here's the same Greek word, 
Actually, it's not the same Greek word. It's the same root word that is used in Colossians. Our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I hope that verse encourages you a little bit. The old body breaks down a little bit here and there. Things pop and crack the way they shouldn't, but they do. But that verse says, the inner man is being renewed. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, therefore, we've got to ask, what do we do when we see the word therefore? What is the therefore, therefore, right? Romans chapters 1 to 11, you know what that deals with? Theology, theology deals with justification and sanctification. He gets to chapter 12 and he says, okay, now let's talk practical. Let's get real practical. And Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Here it is, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, same root word, by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, believers... We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What we allow into our minds affects us. It affects us. We find the same root word in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. We're not going to go there. You can look at it later. But it says, I think it says, He saved us not on the basis of the deeds which we have done, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Same idea. But he he says back in our text in Colossians chapter 3, this is awesome sauce. He says in verse 10, he says, who is being renewed. We're not being renewed into the ways of the world, but he says being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. This This is great. He wants you to be renewed to a true knowledge. One commentator says this, and we're not going to go through all of this because we'll never get out of Colossians before we die. But he says this, quote, man was created in the image of God. This involves man's personality, his intellect, his emotion, his will, and man's spirituality. He is more than a body. When man sinned, this image of God was marred and ruined. Adam's children were born in the image of their father, according to Genesis 5, 1 and 3. In spite of the ravages of sin, man still bears the image of God. Genesis 9, James 3. We were formed in God's image and deformed from God's image by sin. But through Jesus Christ, we can be transformed into God's image. We must be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Ephesians 4, as we grow in knowledge of the Word of God, we will be transformed by the Spirit of God to share in the glorious image of God. God transforms us by the renewing of our minds, according to Romans. And this involves the study of God's Word. It is the truth that sets us free from this old life. Do you remember in Colossians when we heard the word knowledge the first time? In chapter 1, verse 9, do you remember what Paul began to do? He prayed. He prayed for the church at Colossae. He says, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, he uses the same Greek word for knowledge. Verse 10, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He uses this word knowledge a lot in Colossians. If you look at chapter 2, verse 2, 
That your hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. That is Christ himself. We find this word knowledge all over in the word of God. This is, this is so neat. He says, you laid aside the old self. That is, that is positionally, you were set apart for the name of Christ. Remember the work that Christ has done on the cross for you. And then he says, look, you need to continue in your pursuit of Christ's likeness, not because these things save you, but because you love God. Because you love God, you want to know God. You want to live for God. You want to follow God. And as you follow God, you want to be renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. I wanted to go through and talk about image, being created in the image of God, and how does it work with inherited sin, and I, we're not going there. We don't have enough time this morning. But we had to ask the question, my favorite one, so what, right? What does this mean? I'm going to finish soon. What do we mean by soon is the question. So, so I asked you at the beginning, right? We asked the question, how is the power of the cross affecting your daily life? Or we can ask this question, how are you being renewed in your Christian life? How are you being renewed in your Christian life? I have ten things. How is life treating you? You don't have to tell me. Are you discouraged about life? Are you frustrated with your marriage? Are you disappointed with your kids, your grandkids? Are you upset with America? Are you disappointed in our politicians? Are you wanting to give up on life and say, I'm done? How are you doing at being renewed? This doesn't apply to just me. It applies to every one of us. If you profess to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is to be a continual part of our lives. So, I, so I'd ask the question, how are you doing at reading the Word of God? How, how are you doing at reading? If you do we read just, oh, I read a chapter a day keeps the devil away today. You know that's found in the Bible in First Opinions. It's not in there. It's not in there. We read the Word of God because we love our God. That ought to be your reason. And, and, and the Word of God is how we gain knowledge. It's how we are renewed. What does your personal devotion time look like? You know, I was talking with some younger people about reading the Word of God, and I asked them, I said, hey, so sometimes we get busy, sometimes we oversleep, sometimes we're tired, but what is the first thing that you give up in your day? You know what the answer is? The Word of God, every single time. Why is it that we give up our time in the Word? Why don't we give up breakfast? Why don't we give up brushing our teeth? Please don't. But why don't we give up those things? Why, why don't we give up our sleep? Why don't we give up a hot shower to spend time in the Word of God? I find it interesting. I find it interesting that it's the, the Word of God that, that we give up. How do we do it? Meditation. How do we do it? Meditate on the Word of God. Has anybody ever read the Word of God Monday morning and they get home or they lay down at whatever time you go to bed, 8, 9, 10, 12, whatever it is, and you're like, what did I read today? And you're like, I have no idea. Anybody ever been there? I'm just curious. I have. I'll tell you, I've been there. Okay, five of you agree. Good. rest of you, praise God. Praise God. Good for you. We'll talk. We'll do lying next week. How about this one? How about this? How about scripture memory? Anybody love memorizing scripture? Who struggles? Who's trying? Okay, let me share something with you. So I was thinking about this the other day. I talked to somebody recently um, who said, man, I just had a bad experience in church. I said, you know what? We're all sinners. 
And, and, and uh, they shared their experience. I said, that's absolutely terrible. Not acceptable. Not God-honoring behavior in any shape, way, or form. But I said, you know what, man? I said, I really believe, you know, 2 Peter 3, 8, right? Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Yes? We agree on that? Okay. We battle with this idea of the flesh continually over and over and over. But I sure think that Satan has a heyday when, when somebody gets to a point in their life where, oh, I had a bad experience in church, so what do they do? I'm not going to go to church anymore. Satan's ecstatic, right? Because he's stopping the progression of the gospel of Christ because this Christian is upset because their experience they had in the church. But I also think we have the same thing applies when it comes to Scripture memory, right? Anybody ever said, I can't memorize? I'm not very good. Good, good. I've been there. And the Word of God certainly says the memorization is, is, is conditional, right? You memorize the Word of God if you have a good memory. I don't find that in the Bible. I don't. I get that it's hard. I get that it's hard and it requires time and sacrifice and it comes easier for people. I get it. But don't you think Satan is having a heyday when he can distract our brothers and sisters in Christ from memorizing the Word of God because we're not very good at memorizing or it's hard or it's difficult or whatever? Isn't Satan having a heyday? I think so because what happens when we have Scripture in our memory? Then when we're walking down Main Street and we see somebody, we're like, hey, all the sin and falls short of the glory of God. Hey, the wages of sin is death, right? You don't even have to quote the verse reference. Just quote the verse because the Word of God is living and active. The Word of God is what's going to pierce a heart, right? This is awesome. Yesterday, I was challenged sharing the gospel, and I get God gifts to people differently. I don't expect people to do what I do. I really don't when it comes to sharing the gospel. I have so much fun doing it. But yesterday was the first, one of the first times I was like, I don't know what to say or how to respond to you. And I just said, you know, all the sin and falls short of the glory of God. They just kind of looked at me. I thought, oh boy, this isn't going to end well. <laughs> and I said, you know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I just kind of walked away because at that point, I don't think I was going in the right direction. But those things happen when we memorize the Word of God. And Satan loves the fact when he can keep people from memorizing the Word of God because when you don't have the Word of God and you don't memorize it, then you're relying upon your memory. And some of us have fantastic memories. Some of us don't. Some of them have memories that are rusted shut like mine sometimes. And it's hard because we can't recall them to mind. But if we're going to be in this process of renewal, renewing, being renewed to a true knowledge, we've got to be in the Word of God, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God. How about Bible knowledge? I mean, who knows? What is the book of Zephaniah about? How about Ezekiel? What is it about? Guys, it's important as brothers and sisters in Christ that we learn the Word of God so that we can accurately handle the Word of God. And as we do these things, this is all part of that renewing process. You know, we can be renewed, we can renew our minds through Scripture memory, meditation, Bible knowledge, God-honoring music. We can, we can be renewed through discipleship. You guys, I am so excited. We've had people who got baptized, and then we have this one-on-one -on -one discipleship that we went through. Yes, a couple of us remember. We have now some of those who were baptized who are now going through the discipleship program. Praise God, right? Now we have others who are going through the discipleship program. And you know what I'm praying is going to happen? As they go through it, they're on fire for Christ. And so then they're like, hey, when somebody else comes to know Christ, who wants to walk with Christ, I want to disciple them. Praise God. So then they're doing it. And then it's just, it's just the Great Commission working its way out. This is great. So we can be renewed through discipleship. How about this one? Our world certainly hates this one. How about accountability? No one likes accountability. Remember, I, we all come in here and how we're doing, we're fine, we're fine, we're good, we're great, how are you? Great, great, great. And then we're not. We're not. But accountability is so important. How are we growing in our daily walk with the Lord? Oh, I hope and pray that we don't fall into that, that process of a chapter a day keeps the devil away because that's not biblical. It's not biblical. Whatever you read, I pray that you work to apply it to your life. I pray that I seek to apply it to my life because we love God. We're not teaching a works-based salvation. It's because we love God. We're talking to those who know Christ. And if you are a believer, praise God. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments when you want to. No. He says, you will keep my commandments. And his commandments, the, what, the greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is 
Love your neighbor. Guess what? When you love God with all your heart, you know what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen? You're going to keep every command in the Bible. Every single one of them. So often we're like, you know, my kids, I love my kids to death. I do. Yesterday I was having a moment. I was tired. No excuse. And I was like, y'all be quiet. They just looked at me. And one of them said, Dad, why are you, be quiet. Like, Dad, why are you upset? I said, I'm not answering that. Be quiet. Sometimes it's easy, at least for me, to be like, well, I got upset because you guys are being crazy. You're being crazy. You act like this is like an arena just to run around. And you never stop. And you never stop. <clears throat> for me, sometimes I'm too quick to be like, I got upset because you, because you did that. Oh, that's biblical. That's also in first opinions. Because you know what? You know what the problem was? When I started to get upset, you know what the problem was? The problem was I wasn't loving God. Because if I was loving God, God says, what? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It doesn't say when you feel like it. That's what you do all the time. And so if we can just think biblical, but for us to think biblical, we've got to be in the Word of God so that we can be renewed to a true knowledge. So that we can grow in our walk with Christ because we love our God. This is not a works-based salvation. This is because I love God, I want to do these things. Because we love God. So how is the power of the cross affecting your daily life? I believe the first thing should be, verse 9, you should be filled, we should be filled with thankfulness pouring out of us because he laid aside the old self with the evil practices when he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, positional sanctification. It should be the, the power of the cross should be affecting our daily lives because we ought to be continually being renewed in the word of God. That's for the believer. For the unbeliever, what's the challenge? i got to finish. But what's the challenge? It's simple, right? It is so simple, isn't it? What's the Bible say? All the sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. People tell me, well, Jake, I'm a pretty good person. I said, awesome. I had this conversation yesterday with somebody. I said, you know what? I said, I'm glad that you're a good person. I said, you, are you? I said God is holy, right? He's perfect. He is without sin. And I said, if we look at the Ten Commandments, let me just ask you a couple of them. I said, if you ever disobeyed your mom and dad? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, you're rebellious. He just looked at me. I said, well, guess what? I said, have you ever, have you ever murdered? Absolutely not. I said, well, you know, the Bible says that if you've hated somebody, you've murdered them. I said, have you ever done that? He goes, yeah. I said, well, now you're a murderer. I said, you're not doing so well, are you? And I said, you know what? I said, have you ever stolen anything? Well, no. I said, okay, great. I said, have you ever lied? So what does that make you? Well, just a little white one. It makes you a liar. I said, well, here's the big one. Have you ever committed adultery? Oh, absolutely not. I said, praise God. Jesus says, if you look at someone with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Have you done that? Yep. I said, oh, now you're guilty. So now we're doing good. I said, I said have, you ever, have you ever used God's name in vain? And he said, oh, I really try not to. He goes, I did a couple of times. I said, well, now you're a blasphemer. And I said, you just told me that you are a rebellious murderer, blasphemer, adulterer, whatever, at heart. And he just looked at me. I said, so in the court of law, God is the judge. God is standard. is perfect. And he is holy and without sin. God looks at you. Are you guilty or not guilty? Uh... He said, guilty. I said, you know what's awesome, though, is God demonstrates his own love toward us. In that way, we are yes, sinners. Christ died for us. Y'all, even though that we have sinned and done all of those things, God sent his son, Jesus, to this earth. He lived on the earth. He never sinned. He never sinned once. once. And I know that's a hard concept for many to understand. But if he sinned, his death on the cross couldn't atone for the sins of the world. That would be like me saying, hey, I love you, and I think you guys are great and awesome. I'm going to go die on the cross. And I said, what's that going to do for you? And they looked at me, they go, nothing. I said, exactly. That's why Jesus lived a perfect life. He never sinned. It's biblical. Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in all things, yet without sin. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 say that as well. And he went and he died that horrific death because of our sin. And you know what? There's nothing you can do to play a part in your salvation. 
we're contaminated at the core. We're sinners. The Ephesians says it's by grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. The gifts of God, not of works, as anyone should boast. It is by grace. It is unmerited favor. Isn't that awesome? Okay, next time, more than a, mm-hmm. Be like, yeah! Like, y'all, that's killer! That's good. That, that there is God. This is awesome that God would do that. And he says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation. You got to come to a point where you realize your sin is sending you to hell. You turn from your sin, you turn to Christ. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. If you don't know Christ, talk to me, but talk to anybody around you. We're here because we love our God and we have a desire to walk faithfully with Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, You're a good God. You're a faithful God. Lord, I'm so thankful for Your Word that says that Your Word will not return void. Lord Jesus, there's so many things that that we will never understand in the Word of God that maybe they're confusing things that deal with do we have one nature, two natures, the flesh, and all those things. Lord Jesus, here's what I know. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And as a believer, I know that I struggle with sin. And Father, I pray for each one here who knows Christ. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be filled with thankfulness and gratitude just pouring out of our lives because You, in Your kindness and mercy, have adopted us into your family and allow us the honor and the privilege to be called your children. Father, we say thank you. And Lord Jesus, may we have a burning passion to be renewed to a true knowledge, to be be conformed to the image of our Savior. Lord, I pray that we would not view salvation simply as fire insurance that keeps us out of hell. But Father, may we have a burning passion because we love You, to obey You, to become more like You because we love our God. Lord, may we be more than simply hearers. May we be doers of Your Word. And Lord Jesus, I pray that if there's any here in this room who've never placed their faith in Jesus, may they come to understand that now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Because life is a vapor that appears for a little while and then it is gone. Lord Jesus, I pray that they'd come to understand the seriousness of their sin. May they come to understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. Father, I pray that you continue to bless your church and protect your church. I pray, Father, that we would be unified as we seek to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ. In all that we do, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.